My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Thursday, April 27th, 2017. I'm here with Phyllis Sperling at her home in New York City, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Phyllis, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. I'd like to start talking um, about your personal and family background and to flesh out a little bit who you were at the time that you first got involved in the New York cover up. So you were born in 1944 in yes. Brooklyn. Um, and you described your family as a, a Jewish version of Father Knows Best. What, what did you mean by that? I thought I grew up in a very typical American Jewish family. I didn't think about it much, but as I heard people's histories um, throughout my life and, um, and their family situations and tough fathers and mothers that were either distant or too clingy or alcoholic, I realized that my family was way better than typical American family, that I was very, very lucky to have two parents that loved each other really loved each other, who cared about their children, um, and that were very, very American in terms of their values and their dreams, and very, very much Jewish in terms of their values and their dreams. Mm. Tell me about your parents a little bit. Um, my father um, was a dentist. Um, he actually uh, was, he grew up in a in Borough, uh, first one on the Lower East Side and then grew up in Borough Park, and he was, um, uh, went to, um, my father had an interesting um, life because he went to Columbia College and then when he applied to medical school, there were the quotas. And I think it was the beginning of the Jewish quotas. I think he was the first year of the Jewish quotas and he didn't get into medical school. And so he went and got a master's in um, chemistry at Columbia and then reapplied and again was rejected. What, what years are you talking about? Well, my father was born in 13, so 23, 33, 35, 36, I would think. So it was uh, the, the beginning of the Jewish quota. I did some research on this at one point. And, um, and then, uh, so he, he, he says, he called his parents up and he said, Dad, I'm going to be a dentist, because he got into the dental school and he became a dentist rather than a doctor. And ironically, my first year of graduating high school was the year that the, um, that the quotas were successfully challenged in the courts. And, um, and that's when um, and half of the males in my graduating class at Columbia, uh, from Yeshiva Flappish, half of the males were accepted at Columbia College which was huge at that time. What year were we talking about? Um, let me see, 44, 54, 64, no, 62, 60, 62 1962. So it was ironic that my father got stuck in the, in the, in the beginning and the men in my, in my, my classmates were, were, were at the end of it. Yeah. Did your father enjoy dentistry in the end? My father was a, was a happy man, and he was a content man, and yes, he, he enjoyed his patients, he enjoyed his family, he enjoyed his work, etc. If he ever bemoaned the fact that he didn't, wasn't a doctor, it, I never heard it. Yeah. Um, what did your mother do? My mother was grow up on the Lower East Side of one of five in a family of um, shopkeepers, and on the Lower East Side. And she um, uh, had a, a ten-year courtship with my father before um, she married him. And um, I think she wanted him to be established before she married him. I don't, and, and he was in practice by that time. Also, my mother grew up uh, very orthodox, and my father didn't. And I think my mother wanted somebody who was more, more religious um, for her comfort level. And um, my father became the first Shoma Shabbos dentist in, in um, Brooklyn, probably. Uh, he was the first, first not to work on Saturday. Did uh, your mother, was your mother a homemaker, basically? Um, my mother was a homemaker, but my mother was always an organizational lady. She was always um, uh, very, very active in uh, raising money for various um, Israel causes. Um, and. Um, and she also used to be the book report person in Brooklyn, so various organizations used to 
you know, send the car for her to give a book report to there. You know, it was a volunteer. She was a volunteer, mostly a volunteer, right. but very active, very active volunteer. As a matter of fact, when I went to was in um, school for architecture and was going to be a professional woman, my mother would take me shopping and she would um, point at a particular suit and I said, oh, "Ma, you know, this was the, this was." you know, late 60s, you know, when we wore jeans to school, and she would say, that's a perfect luncheon suit. And I said, Mom, I don't go to luncheons, I'm never going to go to luncheons. <laughs> perfect luncheon suit, perfect luncheon hat. You know, uh, she, she, she finally got it, but in the beginning she really didn't. <laughs> and do you have siblings? I have two brothers, yes. Um, they're both younger. Um, one's a um, an orthodontist in Los Angeles, and the other one's a radiation oncologist in um, Massachusetts. So you grew up in Borough Park, which today we think of as a very black hat yeah. area. What was it like when you were growing up? <clears throat> it was always a Jewish neighborhood. Most of the people around me were Jewish, but it certainly wasn't black hat. There were a few Hasidim in the neighborhood. Um, uh, the Chernobyl Rebbe lived across the street, um, but he had barely a, a barely a congregation, and um, and um, my brother would tell me when when the when the reactor broke, she, he says, you know what town that is? That's Chernobyl. That's the Chernobyl Rebbe town. And we you know we we laughed because we never associated that name with 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 geography, an actual place, an actual place, right? Right. Um, so how would you describe the Jewish environment in your home? You said it was, was your family basically modern orthodox? My family was modern orthodox, but I think modern orthodox now means something else. So what did it mean then? Um, well, we were certainly Shomer Shabbos and certainly very kosher at home. Um, but um, my father didn't work with his head covered. And um, after Shabbos was over, so he went to shul Friday night. He and my brothers went to shul Friday night. We all went to shul on, on Saturday. Um, our house was always open to friends, so there were girlfriends first, and then boy, you know, then my brother's friends, and so we always had masses of kids over at our house. Um, uh, they said that you know the refreshments were better at our house. I don't know, and um, <laughs> and then after Shabbos was over, my you know my parents would get dressed, change their clothes, or maybe wear the same clothes, and um, go to um, Lincoln, well Carnegie Hall before Lincoln Center to a concert or the theater or a show or dinner with friends or even dancing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was you know we always had one step in in one foot in each world in my house. The world's being the secular world, the New York world, uh, and the um, the New York cultural world. My parents were very concerned about education. They were very concerned about a profession. Um, they didn't think that their children would be tainted if they were exposed to the New York Public Library. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked when I hear that um, in Borough Park now, um, the children are not allowed to go to the lo local branch of the library. What are they going to find there? You were born during the war. I was born at the very end of the war. World um, War II? Yeah. Um, what? What? Effect. What do you, do you, you probably don't have any memories of the actual war. I absolutely it, have no memories of it. It was what, over the first within my first year. What? What? How did it affect your family? And um, and knowledge of the Holocaust as it was becoming coming more into the sort of forefront of American Jewish communities. Um, my parents have certainly were aware of the Holocaust, and they were became aware of. Most of my father and my mother's family were in the United States. Part of my mother's family was still in Europe and, and was, were lost in Europe. Uh, but these were second cousins for the most part, maybe third cousins for the most part. And, um, and um, I don't remember the Holocaust haunting my household. It was not, um, it was not haunting my household. The parents, our parents, protected us to a certain extent. I went to Jewish day school and my, I, the first, my first conscious introduction to the Holocaust was reading a book about Hannah Senesh when I was in the fourth grade and I think I had to read it in Hebrew, maybe the fifth grade. And um, I was 
shocked. I mean, I was like devastated. It was a big, huge shock. And then I, then I, then I, whether I knew about the Holocaust before, but that was when it really hit home, and it didn't come from inside my family. It came from school. Did you talk to your parents about it? I don't remember. Do you have any memories at all about um, the founding and state of Israel, or your parents' attitudes or relationship to? Well, my parents Israel? were very Zionist, so um, so it was a. I, I I have some very black and white memories. Is that typical in your community or not? To be pro-Zionist in that way? Oh, I think so. Yes, I think so. Certainly, my school was pro-Zionist. Uh, my school, I went to Shalamath School for Girls. I think it was the first Hebrew day school that adopted Tzfardit. So when I learned Hebrew, I learned Tzfardit, and I didn't learn Ashkenazis. And, and that's the way I learned to speak Hebrew, because um, it was a very, very pro-Zionist school. So, so they, of course, all my friends and, and, and their parents must have gone along with it, because um, they could have sent us to Beis Yaakov if they didn't go along with it. So what kind of a Jewish education did you have? You, you, as you said, you went to day school all the way through. All the way through. I went to um, Shalamath um, from kindergarten through the um, eighth grade, and then I went to Flappish for, Yeshiva for four years. And, um, and then I went to Brooklyn College, which was m the local commuter college, because my parents said there was too much sex going on in out-of-town schools, uh -huh. and, um, and they didn't want me to take part in that. And um, <laughs> go, back, go back to your earlier years a little bit, though, first. <laughs> what kind of an education did you get um, as, a, as a girl going to? Um, I went to an all-girls school. So I got, um, I, we didn't have to compete with boys. There weren't any boys there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they weren't raising us to be um, professionals uh, in between zero and eighth grade. But I think that they were giving us very strong identities as as Jews and as Americans both were really stressed we celebrated patriotically all the American holidays and we 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 celebrated we, our music program was all the fo I know every single American folk song because that's what they taught us in music was all the folk songs and I, I was amazed that kids I know from who grew up at the same time from public school don't know any of them you know, I've got an old mule and her name is Sal. You don't know that? <laughs> I mean, um, uh, that's what I was raised on. So we were raised very patriotically uh, for Israel and for, um, and I got a very strong Jewish education in elementary school and, and then again in high school. What was your high school education like? And, and do you, at that point, was it um, a girl's school or is it, uh, was what, it which uh, one? high school? High school. High school was co ed. Co ed. So that would have been the ninth grade, starting from the ninth to the twelfth grade. Um, it was a co-ed. Um, it was co-ed education. The first, um, they, the first year, the ninth, ninth grade, um, the girls and the boys took Talmud, took, took Gemara, Gemara. We had Gemara in the ninth grade, but um, after that they split us. The boys took Gemara and the girls got Mishnah. So we had one year of of Gemara, and then we. Um, then we switched to Mishnah. And that was the only um, splitting. Oh, nope, nope. The boys, I don't know what the boys did, but the girls all did typing. We all had typing in our junior year. After school program was typing, which I never regretted <laughs> learning how to type. 1961 you're talking about. That's 61, right, about then. 1961, the girls had typing. But um, we were all college bound. Men and women were all college bound. Um, uh, men and women went to the the, the best schools around, and um, not everybody at Yeshiva Flappish was orthodox. I was probably more orthodox. A lot of them were conservative, um, and um, uh, so it was. A, I had a, a very good education in elementary school and in high school. Were you involved in any youth groups when you were in high school? No, I don't think so. No, I'm trying to remember. No, we it, it wasn't. Um, I belonged to the the Y youth group. Um, as a matter of, 
As a matter of fact, um, um, when I was in the eighth or ninth grade, um, my youth leader was um, a boy named, an older boy named Avi Dershowitz, who turned out to be, later in life, Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> so he was my he was my youth leader, you know, he was in high school, I guess, when I was in the eighth or ninth grade, a few years old. No, maybe he was a little older than that. Maybe I was a little younger, but I think there's, there's eight years between us. But basically, he, Alan Dershowitz was my, <laughs> my youth leader. In what, what was the youth? It was the Y. It was the Y. Yeah, it was, it was the Y. So we played a little basketball. And, um, and we talked about things, I don't remember what we talked about, but I do remember Avi Dershowitz was the youth leader. What about um, Jewish camps? Did you go to any Jewish camps? Yes. I went to, um, the first time I went to camp was Morasha, which was a um, religious Zionist camp. And we slept in tents and I was too young and I was scared and I w that wasn't very successful. And I, then I went to, I, to Masad which was the Hebrew-speaking camp, which was better. And then after that... What, what was the religious orientation of Mossad? Orthodox, I believe. Orthodox, Orthodox Zionist, Hebrew-speaking. And, um, and then I went to a camp called Maple Lake for a few years. Maple Lake? Maple Lake, which was non-Hebrew-speaking, Orthodox Jewishly, but it was like a camp like all others, but the boys had to go to Davin in the morning. Not, Not the, the girls. girls. No, just Shabbos. Yes, Orthodox, Orthodox, modern Orthodox. Uh, then I went to a camp for two years called Columbia, um, where I was um, 15, 16. And then the year I graduated um, high school, I went to um, Ramaz, Rama, Camp Ramah. So I spent four years in Camp Ramah staff. The last year when you, when you went to Ramah, was, were you already a staff person at that point? Or? I was a staff person from the first year. From the first year? Yeah. I, it, was, it was the year I graduated high school. How did you come to go to Ramah after having attended Modern Orthodox camps all those years? You know something? I don't remember. I seriously don't remember. But I think it came from my mother. And I don't remember how that connection was. Which Ramah were you at? Uh, it was Ramah, Connecticut, when they were still Ramah, Connecticut, and before they moved to Massachusetts. And then I was in um, Ramah, Berkshire for the last two years. Mm. And I met my first husband, David Sperling, in that summer, the first summer, at Ramah, Connecticut. When you look back on these camp experiences, what impact would you say they had on, on you and on your sense of yourself Jewishly? Those are very different experiences. There's clearly similarities, but Zionistically oriented, not Zionistically oriented, and then Ramah, which was uh, so formative for so many people. All, all, all my Orthodox experiences were Zionist oriented. There was nothing that was not Zionistly oriented. My parents wouldn't have exposed me to that. It was not, it was all Zionist, Orthodox Zionist, but Zionist. When Very strongly that, Zionist. Did you think about making Aliyah ever? Was that ever Always. Yeah, always. always. Yeah. Every time I went to Israel, I said, I could live here. Why am I not living here? Then I'd go back to my regular life. But every time I went to Israel, I felt I, could, I should move there and live there. When was the first time you went to Israel? First time I went to Israel was mm, late. Um, for, it was the first time I was really abroad. Um, it was. 16, the war was in 67, I was there in 69. So later, after 69. college, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, Ramah, was Ramah a, a different experience for you? What kind of impact did Ramah have on you? Um, it was conservative, among other things. Ramah was conservative, but I, you know, I, I, I shifted, I shifted easily into it. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, you know, it still had, you know, davening on Shabbos, and it still had, it was still kosher, and it still, it was, it was still very Jewish, uh, so I, I didn't have any, any problem in, in shifting into it. Um, it wasn't particularly more worldly than, than any of the other, than my experience at Yeshiva Flappish. I think the Yeshiva Flappish was more of an exposure to people that were less orthodox, that went shopping on Shabbos, and, and did all those other things. So I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't a difficult step. Yeah. 
to make that transition. Um, it, it had a huge impact on me, but not religiously. It had a huge impact on me because it was the first time I was really in position of responsibility um, and leadership. So um, uh, for some reason or other, they gave me um, positions that I wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, in, in, you know, I was, um, when I was 20, I don't think I was older than 20, I was head of um, Omanut, which was the art, the arts and crafts. I had 13 people working for me. I had a schedule of 13 people. I was 20 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. So that, that was a huge impact on me, giving me that responsibility so early in life. That, that kind of, that was a huge growth. What was your background in the arts that got you that uh, position, so to speak? Uh, I was an art major in college. That was about it. So when I, um, when I, when I was at Camp Columbia in my last years, I, I was an assistant in the arts and crafts. There were two of us, me, the boss, and the assistant. And then when I went to um, Ramah, Connecticut, um, uh, Roz Arts, who was Ray Arts' um, wife, was head of arts and crafts, and I was one of the staff. And then the second year I was staff, and I think it was the last year of the, of, in, in the Berkshires, I was head of the arts, the arts and crafts department for two years, I believe. So it was, um, I had experience, but not that kind of experience. How do you think that changed you? You know, when you're sometimes thrown into a situation and you have to sink or swim, and you end up swimming, um, even if you end up swallowing a lot of water, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's growth. It's, it's definitely growth. And um, now that I think of it, you know, the fact that I, they offered me the job and I stepped up to the plate is amazing to me that I was so young and so inexperienced. And, and then I come there and I have 13 people, except for two of them, all of them older than me. All of them older than me. Um, all of them adults. Mm -hmm. And I was still saw myself as a kid. And they're looking at me for guidance. Was there anything Judaic about the kinds of arts that you did there? Everything was Judaic. It was, it was um, um, in my first year in, uh, well, yes, everything. It was, you know, the, we did scenery for the plays, so that was part of our responsibility. Um, there were Jewish projects. We had a lot of Israelis, um, uh, exchange people, uh, visitors who they brought in who, who taught um, carpentry, who taught uh, various things. Um, uh, and was there a difference in sort of the role of women or girls there that felt at all significant to you in relation to your experiences in, in other Jewish worlds? If it did, it didn't impact on me at that point. It didn't impact at me. Um, the fact that they gave me the job as a woman um, it, well, Roz Arts had it when I was 18, she was head of arts and crafts. Um, camp, a lot of the heads of divisions were women um, in, in Ramah. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't phase me. So you finished high school and then you went to Brooklyn College. Right. You also took classes at JTS, you said. I took classes at JTS for two years, right. So I did continue my Jewish education there. What were you interested in studying at that point? Um, what they gave me. I mean, I, 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 I had really, really good teachers. I had Shalom Paul and I had um, Yochanan Mufs. I had the best teachers there. They were fabulous teachers. And, um, and we studied um, philosophy course. I took, we studied Tillich, which was a new, whole new look at, at, at everything. Uh, for me, um, it was, it, they were very important, that was a very important part of my education, the, um, the JTS college. And I, was that an unusual thing for someone with your background to be doing? Or well, what was unusual about it was it was critical method. So when they taught Bible, they taught critical method, and that I had not been exposed to. I had been exposed to a text with Rashi, I had been exposed to Tosfos in, you know, in, in the Talmud, but, but here they were using other, they were bringing in other sources and they were bringing old sources. So that was very different and very new and very exciting, mm. uh, very exciting. So that was, I would say, a, a good turning point. 
and the difference between what I had before and what I was getting. Yeah. How did you decide on Brooklyn College? Did and I? What was Brooklyn did College? I decide on Brooklyn College? I did don't, you? No. <laughs> that's 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 since they were. I never applied to another school. Um, at that time, um, Brooklyn College, uh, you needed a very high grade point average to get in. Um, I got in. Um, public education. Um, Where did you live? At home in Borough Park. So you commuted. I commuted for four years, and I then I and from Brooklyn College, I would take the subway for an hour and fifteen minutes up to JTS a couple of times a week. Um, I ended up taking um, 18 credits at Brooklyn and um, another six at JTS. You were busy. I was busy. I was busy. I was busy. At what point did you decide to study architecture? Where did that come into your life? And why? How? It's a little embarrassing. Um, when I, I think I. When I was a kid and we had dominoes, I used to, instead of playing dominoes, I used to use them as building blocks. I used to do floor plans with them. I always was doing floor plans. I was always doing planning. And um, uh, somebody might have mentioned architecture. I didn't know any, anything about it. I had no role models in the neighborhood. There was nobody that I, that I knew. I had no idea. Well, we didn't have much architecture in Borough Park or Flowers. <laughs> Um, so I didn't much think about it, and then somebody said you should be an architect. And um, I remember talking when I was in high school, talking to my I had a friend whose mother was a public school guidance counselor, and she said, "Any idea what you want to do? Going to go to college?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, of course." And she said, "Well, what are you going to study?" I said, "Architecture." And she said, "Girls can't be architects." She actually said that, "Girls can't be architects." And I also heard that from another source. Girls can't be architects, so dummy that I was, I bought it. Girls can't be architects. And um, I went to Brooklyn College and I studied art um, with a minor in education, because I'm going to be an art teacher. And in my third year, I took two courses, one in architecture as part of the art major, and the other one in planning. And both my teachers pulled me aside. What kind of planning? Uh, urban planning. Urban planning. City planning, it was called. And um, both my teachers pulled me aside and said, you're really good at this. Why don't you? And my, um, my architecture teacher's name was uh, Papadaki. And he had worked with um, Le Corbusier, Corbu, in Brasilia, on the design of Brasilia. And um, he said, you know, you're really good at this. You should really pursue it. And I said, but girls can't be architects. And he looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> he said, who said? <laughs> he said, I know a lot of women who have had successful, have successful practices. Of course, they were all foreign born. They were all foreign born. So I started thinking seriously of it. And, and Professor James, who taught city planning, said I should go into planning. So I looked at both of those and decided I wanted to do, I would, might pursue architecture, but I didn't have much money to do that. Um, my brothers were coming up, and they were going to be going to college, and I felt that, and very embarrassing, I felt as a girl that, you know, my education had already been paid for through elementary school and private high school. It was the times. It was the times, right. It was the times, and I was definitely a product of my time. And where were your parents on the education of their daughter and well, and they for their then daughter? when I mentioned to my when I mentioned to my parents that uh, so so what happened was that um, Papadaki sent me to Yale and he sent me to um, Harvard and he sent me to Columbia, etc. And um, I looked into those places. I didn't go to Harvard, but I went to Yale, and um, I couldn't begin to afford the tuition at those places. For architecture school. Right. I also got married at the end of my junior year in college. So here I was, a married woman. My husband was studying in New York. I wasn't going to leave. I had to do it in New York. What was he studying? Uh, he was at JTS. In the rabbinical program? In the rabbinical school by that time, right. He was okay. in the rabbinical school. I wasn't going to 
leave town. Um, I didn't have, we didn't have much money. Um, I, I declared independence for my parents at that point under my father's protests. He protested. He said, I will pay your tuition. But I said, no, Daddy, I'm doing this myself. I think I felt insecure. I didn't want to start something and then quit and then have him pay for it. So I figured if I was paying for it on my own, on loans or whatever, then um, I would, you know, it's my head. It was my burden. And so I declared independence from my, from my parents and I applied to Pratt, which had the lowest tuition, and they gave me a 50% reduction in tuition. And I paid $800 a semester to go to architecture school. Now, even at that time, that was nothing. Even at that time, it was nothing. Uh, and, um, and my parents just thought it was funny that I was studying architecture. They just thought it was a gas. Um, it, they, so my mother said to me, look, take it one year at a time, see how it goes, and if, you know, and if it works the first year, you'll go to the second year. And my father, I think, was very proud, and my, but my father died in, in, in this, my second year there. And he had a long illness and he died, so that was a big trauma, but I, I persevered, um, and, you know, it, it didn't hold me back yeah. through that year. So, what was the year that you got married, actually? Um, I got married in, I think, uh, 65. 65. Yeah. So your, your parents, it sounds, were, were quite actually supportive of your goals. Yes, my parents were... I'll give you an interesting story. Many, many, many years later, after the women's movement had so taken over and feminism has had taken over, my mother <laughs> my mother sat down with me one time and, and you know, um, she, and my father was a dentist and my brother became a dentist and then an orthodontist. And my mother said to me, you know, I've been pondering, I've been wondering, how come we didn't encourage you to go to dental school? And I started laughing. I said, Mom, remember the woman that sat in front of us in shul? And she said, yes. She said, we made fun of her because she was a dentist. <laughs> Who, who ever heard of a woman dentist? And it was it was a different it was a different world. I grew up in a different world, yeah. and um, and there were very few women in my class in architecture, and almost all of them, with the exception of two, were foreign born. Uh, were coming as were coming to New York to study architecture from some other country, for the most part. Which is interesting. We think of ourselves as so advanced in that area, and we were so far behind some other places. This was a very tumultuous time, the 60s in oh, yeah. general, in America, American society, um, development of the counterculture, the anti war right. movement, the civil rights movement, assassinations, um, a very tumultuous time, and also the beginnings of second wave feminism. To what extent were you? aware of all of these movements and involved or, or personally uh, involved. Very aware, very aware. Um, and when I was at Brooklyn College, our history teachers would rail against us for being complacent. They said, when I was in college, we were communists, we were socialists, we were railing against you know, pro-union, anti-union, whatever, whatever it was, and you people just sit like logs. And, um, and you know, we all looked at them, so, you know, with our, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, then I went to Pratt, and all hell broke loose. Um, first year was fine, but after that it was just, there were um, always demonstrations on campus. As a matter of fact, I think for the last, two years of my three and a half there, um, we never took spring finals because we're on the picket line of something or other. We late were, 60s, by then you're talking about. Yes, yes, 60s, yes, late, very late 60s. Um, I graduated in, um, I think January of 70, and so we're talking about 69, 68, maybe 67, mm. when, when all hell, hell broke loose on my campus at Pratt. 
but also, um, um, I think my husband at that point was either out of JTS or at Columbia. So all held, we knew a lot of people from Columbia and graduate school in Columbia, and you know what happened there at that time. Well, so, say, say briefly what happened uh, there. Oh, well, you know, it was the SDS movement and the sitting in on the, on the offices and the um, strike at 68. a big strike. Yeah, the big strike. And, you know, we were very, um, we were very sympathetic to it. And we had um, a friend who was over quite frequently who was one of the major, major, major activists in, um, uh, in SDS at the time. I think he was arrested eventually. <laughs> Uh, so we were very much um, um, on, on, certainly in Columbia campus, I wasn't on the Columbia campus, but we were very much new about it and, 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 and sympathetic to that cause, etc. So here you were, a woman in architectural school. To, to what extent were you really aware personally of um, second wave feminism and consciousness raising groups were starting to form? Consciousness raising groups started after. Um, a little bit after, or maybe they had started at the same time, but I wasn't so much aware of that. Um, we were aware of, um, when I first started, at, I, I went to Pratt as an undergrad, I, I finished college and I went to Pratt because I could afford it, but it was a five-year undergraduate degree. There's two ways of pursuing an architectural degree. One of them is a five-year undergraduate degree and you get a professional degree at the end of it, which is called a Bachelor of Architecture. Or you can go four years to a regular college and another three years to a graduate school in architecture and you get a March or a Master's of Architecture degree. That's what you were doing? Nope. No. What I couldn't afford that. So I you, couldn't you afford started that. the undergraduate So program I went again? to an undergraduate. I, start, I, did, I was an undergraduate again. I did three and a half years. They accelerated me, I did three and a half years, and I got a Bachelor of Architecture. Later on, I went to Columbia and got a Master's. But I had another Bachelor's degree. Once you had the, the Bachelor's of Architecture or the Master's of Architecture, they were equivalent. They were both entrees into, they were first degrees into the profession. So it didn't much hold me back, not having the Master's at, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I, I was able to work with that. Um, so were, you ever, were you ever part of a consciousness raising group? Oh yeah, let me finish the, yes. the school experience. Sure. So when I went to, when I started um, Pratt, they um, skipped me from the freshman year into the second year because I was an art major, so I had a lot of foundation work. And I had to double up on my studies because I had to catch up on the calculus and the strength of materials courses, etc. that I had missed. But, but I did it. and. Um, um, a very young girl approached me, who became a lifelong friend, and um, she said, um, would you be my partner in this project? Because they do, they do, in architecture you do a lot of partnership and group work, because that's the way architecture develops. You know, the whole um, Ayn Rand thing about the independent architect is not quite true. So um, I said, okay, um, and she said, I'll, let me tell you why. When I work, when you work with a group that includes three boys and you, she said, the professors just assume that the boys do all the work and that you did nothing and they address all their questions to the um, young men in the, um, and, 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 and nothing to you. And um, she said, but if two women are working, I can't see how they can avoid it. So my friend Lupe and I, she's Cuban born, my friend Lupe and I uh, worked on that first project and we worked on every single subsequent project that was a group or a partnership project, including the thesis. And our thesis project um, was quite a production. It was, it was, a very, it was an extraordinary project. And when we presented our thesis at the end of the year, um, it, it collected a very large group of faculty as critics. So sometimes you only get two people, but we got 10 faculty members who heard our presentation, and the two of us um, gave our presentation. And uh, we got some criticism, we expected some criticism. We got a lot of praise. And at the end, um, 
one of our, um, one of the very respected um, professors, um, and I, I'll mention his name, uh, Hanford Yang, who was a very important architect, um, said, well, you know, gentlemen, this is not my style and this is not my direction in architecture, but um, we have to admit that considering it's two young ladies who did this project, this is excellent work. And I held my breath, but Lupe, who was four years younger than me, Lupe, you know, was very small, and she back was stiff, and she said, I have never been so insulted in my life, and she walks out of the room. So I was left holding the bag there. And then since he was an important architect and since I wanted to learn from him, I elected to take his course the next semester as my last semester there. And um, at the very beginning, he said to me, Miss Sperling, please, please, I don't mean to offend you, but can you tell me why Mr. Esposito was so upset at what I had said? And I said, oh, Mr. Professor Yang, um, you know, and I, t I repeated his remark, and I said, you know, it was, you just implied that there was something inferior about women, that they could not achieve the level of a man in this project. And he said, but, 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 but you know, which means, of course not, <laughs> of course that's where I feel. So he said, but I don't understand. And I said, oh, I gotta hit him hard. So I said, Professor Yang, what happened? Who do you respect most? And he mentioned a number of architects that he, he respected. And I said, what happens if they juried your work? And they said, but gentlemen, considering it was done by a Chinese man, <laughs> it's an excellent project. And he just went into sputter mode. Bop, 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 bop. <laughs> so, you know, that was, I sort of nailed it. <laughs> I think, I, think he did. I think he got it. <laughs> I don't think he changed his opinion, but I think he got it. Um, so you were just going to tell me briefly about your involvement with the, the second wave feminism at that point. Yeah, so um, that was, I had no involvement in anything. I mean, architecture consumed me, um, it consumed me. And, and I actually was working one day a week um, for JASA at the same time. What was JASA? Uh, Jewish Agency for Service to the Aged. No, I worked with JASA later. I don't think I was working at all except during the summers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working summer jobs, which, which filled the coffers so I could survive. Yeah. My husband and I could survive. We were two students. And, and um, so I hadn't, we, I, and, and by this time we were involved with the Chavara. So We were very involved with the Chavara. Which we're going to come to in one minute. <laughs> come to think of it. How would you describe your, your Jewish identity during this period of your um, involvement, at, starting at Pratt, and, and sort of in this period when you were for early marriage? and um, um, My Jewish identity was Orthodox. I was Shomer Shabbos and I was kosher, um, to such an extent that it was problematic. Um, we had one professor who... Um, who assigned a, um, a big jury, a big end of, end of semester project on Shavuot. And um, I went over to him and I said, Professor Rieger, I can't do this. Uh, I can't be there on that day. I'll be there on the second day rather than the first day of the presentation. So he said, no. He was a Jewish teacher. He said, no. He said, you fail if you're not there with that project. I said, how about if I bring the project in the week before and you see it, that it's complete and it's done? He said, nope, you have to be there. So I lived about four and a half, maybe five miles from the campus, maybe six. I delivered my project to my friend Ronnie, who lived um, close to campus in, uh, and um, and he brought the, the project to, to school on that day. And I walked there and back. And he didn't call on me to present. 
<laughs> Pastor, he just died. <laughs> I just heard that he died last a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> so so how, the, how, how did that impact on it? Um, my Jewish identity, remember I was, I had, I, I, I was very involved with the Chavara. So, so, let's, so let's that's, that's that. yeah. um, so my Jewish identity was very, very strong. I was doing both. So the, the New York Chavara was founded in the fall of 69 and you and David were involved from the beginning, correct? Um, yes. Yes, we were, about, we were involved from the beginning. How did you first learn about this new Chavura, or was it really even in the planning stages? At, at what point did you become aware of it and get involved in, at any level? By that time, my husband David um, had a rep, a reputation. Uh, I think he was um, at Columbia at the point. He had graduated JTS. He had been anti-war. Uh, he refused to go into the military. Um, he was very few. He, I think he and Art Green were the only ones in his class. He was in Art Green's class. I think they were the only two in that class that at the seminary at the seminary who refused to go in. So that caused a bit of a hubbub. And um, uh, I first heard about the Chavara, I think, at the point where um, my father, I think, at my, when, it was about when my father had died in '69. It was. The formative year, uh, toward the end, I don't know, remember exactly if, I think it was Alan, Alan Mintz, who came to talk to David about, about the Chavara, about the because they were looking for teachers at that point, and they asked him if he would be a teacher. And um, Teacher, what, what was his field? Uh, he was doing um, Bible, he was doing ancient Near Eastern languages under uh, Moshe Held at Columbia. And, um, and he, um, he was very busy, and he basically said no. He said no? He said no. But I was mad for the idea. I loved the idea of what they were talking about. I mean, they were talking about, and you, you know the spiel already, um, um, a, 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 a close to being a commune kind of organization that um, would um, pray together as Jews, that would go to demonstrations together as Jews, that would study together as Jews. And uh, I loved that concept. I really resonated to it. And I said, oh, please, please. And he said, OK. So he called him back and he said, I'll do it. <coughs> and that's how I got involved. <laughs> um, uh, so let's, let's dig into some of the aspects of the Chavara at this point. Um, you know, the, there was a brochure that was written in the, in the very first year, in that formative year. I think John Rusquet was involved in it, and Al, probably Alan and Peter Geffen, those who were mm -hmm, involved, mm -hmm. and with, with Eugene Wiener. Wiener right. Um, who was another teacher. He was another teacher. Yes, he was, he was asked to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so the Chavara in this brochure envisioned the creation of what they called a new kind of religious leadership for the Jewish community and saw itself as a, a model for mm -hmm. a new form of Jewish life. Did that vision speak to you? I, I, was ne I never saw myself in a position of Jewish leadership. I mean, I knew I wasn't going that way. I was in architecture school, I was going to be an architect. So no, it would, the leadership part certainly didn't appeal to me. Um, the rest of it did. Did it appeal to David other than the time commitment? You know, his concerns about the time commitment? Um, I don't know if he actually saw himself, he, he saw himself as being an academic, a scholar, and a professor. I think that those were his aims. I don't think that he want, he was looking to change the Jewish world and the Jewish leadership, not like John and Peter and Mm -hmm. I don't even know if Alan was so gung ho on that. Was he friends, and were you friends with Art Green, and aware, yes. and aware of yes. what yes. was happening in Boston with Chavarat Shalom? Yes, uh, we I we knew I knew Art Green from the seminary years. You know, when David was in the seminary, and, and Art Green was a friend, so um, so we knew Art Green quite well. And were you aware of Chavarat Shalom as it was being? Of course, uh -huh. yes, I was aware of Chavarat Shalom, but not 
as aware of it as I became after, you know, the interest in, in um, and I'm trying to remember exactly when, um, when David was asked um, to be, um, I, I, I pretty much know, because it was around my father's death, and that's why I remember it so clearly. So it would have been around Passover. So it would have been the Passover before, before, my father died in 69. It would have been Passover of 69. So in the, and the Chavarah started that fall, basically, right? And the Chavarah started that fall. So we were already invested in, um, David was into the formative, you know, making it happen. So it was, um, let me see, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. So six months before, yeah. actually. So, um, Let's delve into some of the specific aspects of okay. the of the Chavura, um, but both in terms of the expressed ideal, but also the lived experience for people who were involved. Okay. So, the first being community, since many people felt that community and feel that community was the very heart of what yes. the Chavura was experience sure. was about. Um, you'd grown up in this in an intensely Jewish community. What do you think distinguished the Chavarah's vision of community from what you had already, always known? Well, there's, known there's, 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 people use the word community to mean neighborhood, too. I grew up in a very Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The community we were forming uh, was, was, was much more of a, of a chevra than it was a, a neighborhood. So you're using the word interchangeably, but there was no comparison. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had friends um, from school, from both um, elementary school and high school that I hung around with. These were important friends in my life. Um, but, um, but it was different from, from the chavara. Right. It was very different from the commitment to the chavara. Yeah. Um, as, as someone who was recruited to teach, David, did David, or you have to go through any kind of an admissions process? Um, no. No. Okay. I mean, obviously, so obviously they had discussed him and decided to ask him, and so all he had to do was say yes right. or no. And how about you? you? I was not asked one way or the other. I came along as his suitcase. <laughs> as his what? Suitcase. <laughs> What, what do you mean by a suitcase? I was, I was, you know, it, I, I was... Something uh, he brought along. <laughs> right, I was baggage. <laughs> I see. Um, what were, what about other um, wives or partners of people who were involved in being either well, that, recruited? That, well, that was, that was, that was one of the interesting things about it is that um, uh, they did not say, ex part of the idea, Idea was that this would be a, an alternate rabbinical school, I think. I think that was the original intent. It's, you must have learned that by now, mm -hmm. that it would be an alternate rabbinical school. And when one woman um, applied, um, they had a huge debate about whether they were going to take a woman as a primary member. A huge debate. I'm not privy to that debate, so I'm not going to talk about that debate. And did anybody talk about that? That there were only that there were discussions. Um. Okay, so there were tremendous discussions about it, and finally, um, she was admitted as the only woman member, primary member, and she was a single woman, so she didn't bring a husband along with her. So mm -hmm. she was. Um, so there were. I can't remember how many we were in the beginning. I really don't. Twelve primary members, number of wives, number of girlfriends, but she was the only member. The only member who was a woman who was admitted, admitted in her own admitted, right. right. Herman, uh, uh, David was admitted as a teacher. He was a teacher. What was your sense of what the admission process was at that? I had no early sense stages. of the. I had no knowledge of the admission process at that point, mm -hmm. for the first year. I didn't even know there was an admission process. Was David at all involved, or you don't know? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, What's your sense of what kind of person they were looking for? Were, were there or any, any sense of the criteria by which someone would be admitted or, or not? 
And what were the issues, I mean, can you imagine what the issues were around whether or not to admit women? Was it, was it the issue of the seminary, that it was a rabbinical training ground, or was it something larger? Since I wasn't part of that, I'm not going to. Okay. I'm, I wasn't part of it. Mm -hmm. They didn't share with me. I don't know. How would you describe the people who were involved early on? I mean, generally speaking, what kinds of people were involved in those early years, in that very early year? Um, I think that a lot of the people that were involved in those early years were, were, had, were either people that had thought about going to rabbinical school, men, had thought about going to rabbinical school or had been in rabbinical school and were dropouts. And um, uh, so when I look back on it, um, uh, when I look back on it, and I didn't know it at the time because people were still more or less in the closet, there were two gay men that were part of the first year. Um, um, but I didn't know it at the time. And... Because um, they were in the closet. No one knew what you are saying at the time. People didn't. I know think no everybody knew it except for me. I was very naive. I came from Borough Park. <laughs> what did I know? <laughs> what did I know to look for? <laughs> I didn't... Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a. Well, I'll tell the story later, but no. okay, I'll tell it now. Tell it. Yeah, um, we were driving back from a retreat. Early on, early on, I was sitting in the back of the car with this guy who was only in the chavara for one year, and he said, "How would you vote if? Um, how would you vote if um, a gay man?" Homosexual. I don't even know if we used the word gay at the time. How would you vote if a homosexual person um, uh, wanted to join? Now, I told you that, that I was, I told you, but I didn't say it here. I was, I'm, I'm not an intellectual. Oh, I was, I was the, I was the non-intellectual in a sea of intellectuals. I was, I think I was their comic relief. <laughs> but, um, uh, and, and, and I kept on stressing that, you know, I didn't deal in hypothetical debate, I, I dealt with realities, I was, I was really the, not so much the anti-intellectual, because I'm not anti-intellectual, I was just the non-intellectual in this group, who debated, um, I once spoke to John and he said, you know, don't you love process? And I said, I hate process. I'm a result-oriented person. <laughs> I'm going to skip process and go to result. But we, he used to tease me, and I used to tease him. And I used to tease Alan Mintz for being too verbose. And I, you know, I said, you know, college boards are over. You don't need to use those words anymore. I was the comic relief. So, so this, this young man asked me um, what I, you know, hypothetically, so I said, you know me well enough. I don't deal with hypotheticals. A gay person wants to become part of the Chavara, I'll think about it. And that, was, that was my answer. Little did I know that he was already in the Chavara. And, and, um, but I didn't know at that time. Yeah. It wasn't like I was hostile. It was like I was naive. Um, uh, were you aware of... Um the, any sort of changes around uh, policy or feelings about admitting women, and when, when did that happen? Yeah, that was, that was an, and I was very instrumental, somewhat instrumental in, in that change. It was about halfway through. Now, you halfway have, through what? The first year. Halfway through the first year. Um, what happened was that the Chavara had an apartment at that time, and a uh, beautiful apartment. No, the first apartment was on... Um, was right over here on 100th, 102nd, mm -hmm. 102nd was our first apartment. We had a beautiful apartment. God knows that the landlord let us have this apartment, which now is about $3 million <laughs> um, that, that let us have this apartment, a bunch of young hippies, you know, <laughs> graduate students, but he, he did. And um, so we rented an apartment and we used to have um, dinners in that apartment once a week, in which we cooked ourselves. Somebody was responsible for cooking. And, um, and then we would go on retreats once a month, and all the food was brought up, and that was a lot of cooking. And the guys cooked, some of them, but for the most part, the wives and girlfriends did the cooking. 
the wives and their girlfriends did the cooking and the wives and girlfriends did the cleaning. And, um, and yet we were part of almost everything on the retreats and we were certainly welcome at all those dinners, basically we were doing the cooking. <laughs> and um, and uh, we saw ourselves as part of the Chavara, a very important part of the Chavara. And um, one of the women whose husband was a member of the Chavara and actually only that first year called me up and she was working. She was, she was out of school and she was working. And she said, um, you know, Phyllis, something happened to me and I'm very upset about it and I wanted to talk to you about it. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, you know, I had a week off from work and the classes were in my house, in my apartment. Classes were in my apartment. The classes for the Havara? Havara had three, four classes running every week and her husband was in one of them and, um, and she sat in on the class and was told she couldn't because she wasn't a member of the Havara. And I was appalled. I was like, I went through the roof. I was totally appalled. I said, what? You couldn't sit on the class because you're not a member of Havara? So the next meeting I brought it up and I said, this is what happened and we're doing your cooking and we're doing your cleaning and we're doing your schlepping and we're doing the planning for these retreats. I said, we're not members of the Havara. And there were a lot of fumfering and a lot of whatever. And I think it was decided just at that meeting that, that when a couple came in, a couple was, they were both members of the Havara. So it was decided that night that... that by a group uh, of male members or by... Were by there women by there too? everybody sitting there, I think it was decided. Because there were, just, there were women there too, because the wives and girlfriends were there as well, whoever was there. So um, I think that they, I think that they realize that that will. Sometimes you just need somebody to point you in the right direction. It sounds like it had been. It was in the air. And that it had been ambiguous that you were sort of members. It was ambiguous. Um, sometimes you have to. Some, sometimes something's in the air, and 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 people don't change so fast. But when somebody points you in the right direction, and I just think that I brought it to a head. And it wasn't, it wasn't a big debate. It was just, yeah, well, let's reconsider our policy and let's go do it this way now. So, so I felt very good about that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But to push that envelope a little bit, did that mean that um, both people had to be accepted or if they wanted, if the group were interested in, let's say the male member of a couple that okay I, I I said that in the very beginning during the formative times and maybe in the, be, the beginning of the first year I was not aware of admissions policy there might have been I wasn't aware I wasn't a full-fledged member at the time uh, but after that I, I became aware of of the policy and the policy I believe for the New York cover was that um, um, the one person applied usually a man and um, and then he was um, accepted, etc. But after that, then both people needed, they, they applied as a couple. And, um, and they were accepted as a couple. I think that um, they needed a majority vote. I'm not sure. I was never part of any kind of admission vote or, pro pro thank God, I was never part of any of that. But I think that if they had one, one black ball or two black balls, then they, if somebody really, really, really had a hesitation, a uh, member had a hesitation, then maybe they wouldn't get in. Um, we took mostly everybody, not everybody, but mostly everybody, I think. This is one of the critiques that's leveled often <coughs> in those early years, this, as a small intentional community, that it was um, elitist in its it is elitist, in, it was elitist, etc. But now I'm running a much larger organization um, as a volunteer, and um, and we have to we have sixty groups of of eight to fifteen people, sixty of them now. And when we form a new group, and we now we know personalities. When we form a new group, there are some people that we just need to exclude because they're disruptive. They're highly political. 
um, they're crazy. I mean, we work with old people, <laughs> so you know, they're they're just they we they so there are some people that we just say they're not going to work in harmony with others. But we take everybody. But some people that have a track record already, we shy away from putting them in that group because they can be very disruptive. And I think that that was the idea. It's not like I don't like you. It's basically they're known to be disruptive. They have a reputation for being that way. So again, I have never been part of any kind of vetting, interview. I was never part of that process. Mm -hmm. I just, that's what I'm aware of. So it was kind of a necessary um, necessary evil in a sense that I'm not saying it was or it isn't evil. you know yeah. I, I'm not saying it was uh, it, it, it was the Chavara elitist we thought we were terrific I mean, we thought we were the elite of the elite the creme de la creme oh. and maybe we were um, you mentioned communal meals that happened um, every Thursday evening, often followed right. by a community meeting or... A Always followed by a program. Mm -hmm. Or a program sometimes, right? A meaning a speaker, right. someone who would right. be invited to come and, and talk right. with the group. Um, there were these kinds of regular occasions, the communal meals, the meetings, monthly Shabbat retreats that were, sounds like the cornerstones of sort of the community. Oh, I our community. Your community. Not using community as neighborhood. Yes, and also there was, um, there were davening. There was also prayer. There were also services, weekly services. Now, I, one of the things I should explain was that first year, uh, David and I were living in Brooklyn. So we came to all the retreats. We got ourselves to every monthly retreat, and we also came to every Thursday meeting. But the... Uh, but we didn't, part, because I was Shoma Shabbos at that time, we didn't participate in the, in the services on Shabbos. So but I, I know, because yeah. I yeah. Could, couldn't get there. Um, the next year, and by the middle of the next year, so after a year and a half of the Chavara, so February of the next year... You're talking about um, 71 at that point? Well, Sharon was born in... September 70, I'm talking about 71. In February of 71, um, David had a job in Stony Brook, so we moved out there. So we were very much members of the Chavara, but we knew what was going on, etc. But we were physically two hours away mm -hmm. from, from all of this. So we did not participate in the weekly meetings, but we went to almost all of the retreats. And they started to make the tr retreats out on um, Shelter Island. Most of the retreats were in Shelter Island so that we could get there. Where is Shelter Island? Um, it's between the North and South Fork of Long Island, far east, eastern Long Island. So that made that possible? So it made us, and they did it to make most of the retreats were there so we could get there. And we went to what we call the um, anchor retreats, which was the, um, the long retreats on, um, on Shavuot and Sukkot. So those were the three-day retreats, rather than the one-and-a-half, two-day retreats. So a typical retreat, t tell us about the retreats, because they were clearly very central. In the very of central. The community. So the, the typical retreat, um, and, I, and I remember one was um, we would rent a space, in, cheap space in some state park, usually some unheated cabin in the middle of the winter in some state park, and we were, uh, the only um, the only Heat was from a fireplace that had to be kept going all night long um, in the central space. And I remember we all had sleeping bags and we all slept end to end in this big space. Those all of us were in this on big space on the floor and our sleeping bags, it was the only, it might have been the only space, but it certainly was the only warm space. And um, at some point later on, we became adults and graduated to bunk beds. <laughs> you know, four or six to a room, but in the beginning we all slept on the floor and, and, and then, you know, when, then the tables would be brought out and, and we had all this, all these food prepared, all we had to do was heat it up or even eat it cold. How did the food get out there? People who, uh, they, we brought it. <laughs> and part of it, 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 part of the hard part was it had to be there before Shabbos. And in the was wind, that a, Was that a given? It was a rule. It was a rule. The food had arrived before Shabbos. 
um, because um, sometimes we had an Orthodox member who was strict about it, um, but that was the sh and that was the hard part was arranging to get the food to the retreat before Shabbos, especially in the winter when Shabbos started at four thirty. <laughs> So some people would, how are we going to do it? There's a lot of organization, a lot of work on this. So you say, I can, I'll cook a Thursday night and I'll bring you to your house, because you have the car. And so some people could not get there, some of the cooks could not get there until after the workday was over, until later, but the food had to get there first. So a lot of us ended up bringing the food to somebody who we knew was going to get there before Shabbos, and he would bring the food up. Did the food have to be prepared? I mean, ready, ready to be served, so it could be heated. Except for salads, tuna fish. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it could be heated. I mean, we were. It was a. There was a lot, and this was this was every month. Who made these? I mean, what was the arrangement for making these arrangements? And I'm curious throughout the extent to which there was sort of gender differentiation. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure and I don't remember. I do remember that, you know, uh, we knew who had cars and we knew who, who were free to leave. So it, after a while it wasn't, after a while it was just, um, listen, um, I'm not going to get there until after Shabbos, so I'm going to cook on Thursday and I'm going to bring it over in a shopping cart to you and you'll get it up there. And, and after a while it was just easier because we knew the cars that were going up early and the cars that were going up late. And I don't remember who did the driving, who made the transportation arrangements, but somebody was always... I remember that Jerry Serrato always did the cheshbon at the end. Um, where, um, so the way we worked it this way, and it was always Jerry, um, we would um, say how much we spent. Each of us would... We didn't submit restraints, seats. It was, but we would say, I spent... $28, I spent $35, I spent $12, I bought the wine, many dollars, and we would all give him the chits with our name on it and how much we spent. And some people didn't spend anything, so their names went into it, etc. And we would add on to that the rent for the space, um, probably nothing else, and he would add all those things up, and he would divide by the number of people, and then he would hand you the chit with whether you got money back or whether you had to contribute more. And everybody did that, put in the money, and then he was able to give back to people. And it was all done in less than a half an hour after Shabbos. Nobody went home until Jerry did the cheshbon. <laughs> it was all settled up in half so an hour. So it didn't go into a communal pool per se. It, it, everybody, it was settled up. If you were owed $11, you got it before you left, Yeah, et And they were also with Havara dues because we also had an apartment rent to pay. So everybody, I don't remember what the Havara dues were. It wasn't onerous. It was a couple hundred dollars a year. It was very little. But there were Havara dues because we were paying for the apartment. And that's all we were paying for. That's all you were paying for? And I believe. The rest maybe insurance. So anything that was an ongoing, I mean, a, a, a one-time expense, ongoing one-time expense, like the retreats. The retreats you paid for basically on the spot at, at the time. Yeah, I don't remember how we did dinner. I don't remember whether, you know, we alternated oh, the dinner, dinner, the weekly dinner. We alternated the weekly dinner, so maybe we, you know, we just bought it, all the ingredients, and then served it. Um, and then somebody else did it the next week. I, maybe we didn't get it. I don't remember. Was there a, a community sort of position of someone who recruited people or set the schedule or how did all of that happen? No one I remember. I don't remember. I have probably just a, a, a sign up list uh. that the dinner is yours, the dinner is. Yeah. I remember um, dinner, cooking a dinner with Alan Mintz, who was a, really a cook, and he taught me a lot. <laughs> what did you cook with him? It was, I don't know, I don't remember. I think it was chicken, though. I can't remember why we had flesheks, but it might have been fish. I don't remember, but I remember learning a lot because he was a really good cook. The New York cover I was known as, <laughs> as the one, the, the, the foodies. one with the really good food. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were, you know, the, I think that the Boston cover I was way more spiritual than we were. And... Um, we considered ourselves way more intellectual than the Boston Harbor. <laughs> and some people would say more political as well. Uh, probably more. We were very political. Yeah. 
that was another big thing of going on those Washington marches. Yeah. It was a very um, big thing. Before we leave the subject of uh, food. Uh, important. <laughs> it is important because yeah. it was, it bound the community. It bound together. the community. Um, did people invite each other to their homes? Was that, was it, was it an inviting, like a Shabbat inviting community? Also. You know, it might have been, in, for the people who lived in Manhattan, remember I lived in Brooklyn and then I lived in Stony Brook. So we had people over to our house, but we were, used to laugh that very few people would make the, um, the, the trip to Brooklyn. Um, uh, Martha was one of the few people that came. Um, Martha Al, um, you know, um, And um, Dina Rosenfeld was one of the few people that came. Uh, but. I think the Shev I think the Shevises came once too, but it was it, people didn't come, especially not on Shabbos. It was far. Brooklyn was considered like we, you know, Oklahoma. <laughs> not anymore. Um, so as you said earlier, these um, meals, the Thursday evening meals, are often followed or usually followed by a meeting. Yes, always, always, always followed by something. Um, that was, that was the important part. The meeting was the important part, not necessarily the dinner. What the was dinner so was, important about the meetings? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't Do really you remember? remember. Were, there, were there kinds of, what kinds of topics or issues would get discussed at the, at the meetings? Were, the, were there issues in sort of the function of the community? I think that the, it obviously, you know, it was the war in Vietnam. It was, we talked about that. Um, uh, somebody would give, you know, talk about something, you know, Jewish or, I, I, you know, it, 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 it was a while ago. Yeah. I don't remember. But, you know, it, I was pregnant. You were pregnant. <laughs> so we're talking about 70, 69, 70? When was Sharon born? Sharon was born in September of 70. Yeah, so yeah, I was late pregnant. 69. I was pregnant. Yeah. No, I think, wait a second. So when did Havara? Um, Havara started in, in the fall of, of 69. Yes. So the Havara started in the fall of 69, uh, and she was born in the fall of 70. So I was pregnant for nine months. Of that first of that, year, well, for for most for from January, I, I I know exactly when I got pregnant. I know exactly where I got pregnant. It was in John Ruskay's father's house. <laughs> <laughs> was that a Chavara function? It was a Chavara New Year's Eve party in his father's house. I don't remember, but that that I I I. I he said, how can you be sure of that? And I said, pretty sure. <laughs> and she was born nine months later in the end of September. So, so I say for the first, from September, October, November, December, and then I didn't know I was pregnant for a while. So, right. But then I was pregnant. So it's important to note, I think, that um, the Chavara was originally composed of individuals and couples, but there were no children. Yes. In the very beginning, right. in fact, you were the first. Right. Yes, mother. I was the first. I was the first mother. Um, you broke that mold. So, right. what was it like to become the first mother in the group? Um, it was. And it for was, Sharon to be the first child. So, t tell us about that. Um, well, one of the Thursday meetings that I remember quite well it was when um, I don't think she was two weeks old. And I brought, of course, this is important, I brought my baby to the, the, the meeting, the Thursday night meeting, and everybody oohed and odd, etc. And, and, and actually they ended up, pat we were all sitting on the floor, they actually passed this baby around. And, um, and I hope I don't embarrass John this way, but John held her and he went like this and he went, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> This is so boring. <laughs> you don't forget that. <laughs> so give me my baby. <laughs> and <it's> like <laughs> the fact that you know he could say that and I could laugh <laughs> showed you, I think, the closeness of the of group. the group, right, and, and the comfortable level that we had in it. Um, so Sharon was the first baby, and they were a lot of. Um, 
women, um, some of them, I mean, I wasn't very old at the time, I was 26, um, 25, 26. The women that were 23, 24, mm -hmm. a little bit younger than me, and they would just, they would just, I would go to a retreat, I didn't see her. They just took over. One, one would be mother to another, would be mother, she was handed out. Um, somebody would knock on the door when I was sleeping and they say, is she up yet? And I said, yeah, I think so. She said, okay, and they'll come in and take her out of the crib and change her and get her out of there and I got another two hours sleep. <laughs> so I, uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. She was adored. The child was adored. Um, Were the men as mesmerized by her as the women? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. <laughs> but, but the, um, she had, she had, a number of mothers in that first group, three. What did that feel like to you, to be the first? Great. Oh no, I, it was it was fine. I didn't have any problem with it. Um, um, you know, sometimes you know I would, but I was a very conscious mother in 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 places where there were groups, and she made a whimper. She was taken out. I didn't wait for somebody to say, "Take that baby out." I, I took that baby out. Um, or David took that baby out, or one of the mothers took the baby out. We, we, we never let her interfere with what was going on. As a matter of fact, we went on a retreat once at Shelter Island, and she was a toddler at the time. And um, uh, we were sitting around having, it was a Friday night dinner, and we were sitting around having whatever we were talking about, lesson, you know, whatever and you know the, all the doors I re would make sure that all the doors were closed so that wherever she went she was in the same room and uh, I wasn't watching her and um, at some point I turned around to look for her and she was walking around the table reaching up for the little cups of wine <laughs> toddler was drinking all the wine around the table. Must have been sweet wine. Yeah. Sweet wine, yeah, she liked it. So, um, you know, so she was, the, she was the baby that was around. Um, um, when was the next baby born, do you think? Or when did other couples begin yeah, having babies? Um, Ilana Reske was the second baby, who was a couple of years younger. And then Paula's two came. So there was the four girls, the four girls, that were raised together. And, um, and they were very, I mean, there was a difference of two years or three years in their ages, but they were very tight. Those four girls were very little tight. Girls. Four, four little, little girls. girls. Right, and then, then um, David Ellenson's came in with a baby, or Baby was born. No, no, they came in from Israel because Ruthie was born in, in Israel. So you're, they you're came. You're talking in. about later. I'm in, talking about later. 70s. Right, right. So, um, so basically, those four girls were the were the first babies in the Havra, and mm -hmm. um, and formed. I don't know how far you want me to go on that. So, well, I, that was it. Was very the children were very important in the Havra. The children in the New York Havra were very important. How did it change, the Chavara? You know, Chavara, it's hard to say because the Chavara was changing already. Remember, everybody there was in graduate school. Um, and, um, and many of them were academics. And they got jobs. Um, the Hundreds went to Montreal. And Bob went, and Judith went to um, Kansas. And um, David Ellenson first went to Boston and then to Los Angeles. Um, um, people, uh, people went to Israel. Um, this is over the course of the 70s, largely. So it was over the, uh, very soon. I mean, very, very soon. I mean, as soon as, you know, they, people were graduate students. So how long are you a graduate student? Two years, three years? And then you get a job on some campus somewhere else and you're gone. Or you continue somewhere else. Uh, so a lot of people left and new people came in. So we had new people came in and had more children. And, um, and, um, but the original people, um, some of them stayed very close and in very close contact and were always part of the Havara, even if they were only there for the first three years or the, or the second. The, the, the interesting thing about the Havara was the, um, 
The real formative year was not the first year. The real formative year was the second and third year. Because, because the people that came in there, that second and third year were the ones that stuck. And a lot of people in the first year, I can think of three or four or five, about half of them were gone by the second year or the third year. So because for one reason or another. Um, the two gay guys were gone that second year. Peter Geffen, I think, didn't left after one year or two years. Um, for all different reasons. Um, and somebody else went to Israel with his wife. And um, so I would say only half of the first year survived. The formative years of New York Havara were definitely the second, third, and, and fourth. And who, who were some of the people who came in in those years? Well, Zevin Leslie didn't come in the first year. Um, Misha and Jackie came in after say, that. Say last names for, oh, so, um, for the Schenkins. The Schenkins, um, um, the Gutworth Avramoffs uh, were second or third year. Um, uh, Flora and Arye Davidson were third and fourth year. The Hundreds were second or third year. Um, most of the people yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. Bob and Judith. Uh, Goldenberg came in, they were in Kansas, I believe. Okay, they came in Second, 70, third. 74. Okay, so that's fourth year. Mm -hmm. So it was the real, the real Havara. The, the first year Havara was the experimental, the where are we going, how are we going to do this, etc. Um, um, Jerry Serrata was out after what, four years, five years? You know, he moved too. So, um, so the real formative Havara was the second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. That, that, that was the strongest period. period. And that was the year when babies were made and people came in with babies. So, um, the, so the children were, were very important to the Havara. So how, how did the introduction of more and more children um, affect the Havara? Um, both in terms of its sort of weekly activities and also the monthly retreats and, and the larger retreats that took place around the Chagim? Um, I can, I, again, um, we moved out of the city when Sharon was four months old. So that's after the first, that's the February of, so we were very involved in the Chavara for the first year and half and sometime in February of that second year we moved out and we were out of the city for three and a half years before we moved back and then that time we moved to the Upper West Side so we were very much involved again um, but we never really left the Chavara because as I told you we had the month we went to the monthly retreats and we went to the big holiday retreats so how the how the addition of children other people's children um, change the mix or change the dynamic. I couldn't really answer that on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, almost all the women in the Chavara were career women. So they were working jobs, they were being mothers, they had nannies at home with the babies or daycare. Um, fathers were hopefully, you know, liberated and they were doing their, their burden of child care. So I don't know how it affected the um, the day-to-day. -day. But um, it didn't change things on the retreats that much either. We didn't program for children. You did not. We did not program for children. Uh, they hung out and they hung out with each other and they ran around with each other. Um, so the, of course the little ones stayed with their parents but the, as soon as you were four you were running with the, with the crowd. And, um, and I know you're not interested in the later years of the Chavara, but no, I yeah. think that those early years of the Chavara were very impactful on the later years because the kids would program for themselves. And one of the things they did was they wrote plays. They were constantly writing plays. And they would huddle in some, one of the bedrooms and um, I think my daughter, who was the oldest, uh, Sharon and Ilana and Judith, um, were doing the scripts, 
This is Judith Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum, and, Rosenbaum, and Alana, Alana Ruske. And they were doing the scripts, and they were writing the scripts, and, and they would announce that they were doing a production, and we would schedule the production for, you know, Saturday afternoon or whatever, and everybody was there for the production, and the kids were fabulous and funny and great, and they did, they did a play every retreat. And that's what they were busy doing, aside from running around. Um, and they, they involved the very smallest kids. Every single child in the Chavra was given a part, not just the oldest ones. Did the plays have um, specific kinds of themes, or were, what, what were the plays about? Usually they were making fun of us. <laughs> so we had a, um, I think it was a bar mitzvah re retreat. Was it the bar mitzvah retreat? What do you mean by a bar mitzvah? We had a 13 year, we had a big celebration, 13 years, it might have been a 20 year, whatever it was, but the kids did another play. Now this meant they had to prepare for this. It was a big re retreat, we invited all the old members, you know, etc. And the kids, the, the kids did a retreat. And of did course, a, a lot of them were extrapolating about what we did in that first year. So they, they dressed like hippies with bandanas, etc. And of course, they were all smoking weed. <laughs> you know, that's what they thought we were doing in that first year. <laughs> and one of them was me, and another one was somebody else. And they just, they just, they just got us. <laughs> they, they were devastating. <laughs> They were they, they, These are smart kids. I mean, they they're, they're well. smart kids and they knew us well. They grew up as a family and that was the interesting thing and I think that I want to mention that as important. Growing up in the Havara was very important to my daughter and very important to the, um, uh, the Rosenbaum kids and very important to um, all of them. And, and they still see each other and they still talk to each other and they still meet when they're all in the city and they go out to dinner. And we even tried to put some of the, the grandchildren together, etc. And, and that, of course, they have less of a bond. But these, these kids, they know each other and they're cousins. And they really bonded in those years. And almost all of them have bemoaned the fact that they don't have anything like that now. They miss that, 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 that bond of, of community that they made with these other kids on a monthly basis, pretty much, and certainly on the retreat holidays. Yeah. They knew each other well. Did they eventually, um, do you remember, for instance, any of the kids becoming old enough that they, and interested, that they would take part in the tefillah or any of the sort of, sort of more formalized aspects of what happened at a retreat? Good question. I don't think so. I don't remember that happening. I don't remember that happening. I don't think they cooked or cleaned either. <laughs> After a while, of course, um, when, we, when, when the children became part of it and when, when people were working, then, and we had a little more money in our pockets, then we would go to retreat centers that cooked for us vegetarian food. So they weren't always Jewish places. Some of them were Protestant places, but they did, or well, some of them were, were you know, um, vegan retreat places. And we always had um, uh, vegetarian food cooked for us, so we we didn't have to bring food anymore, and that was after many years of the chavra, right? So let's turn now to the question of prayer, which was a central activity for some of the early chavra, although somewhat less so for the New York chavra. Not not really, no. Prayer was very important. Many people say that it was rather sporadic in the first year or so, other than on the monthly um, retreats, Shabbat retreats. Yes, and, and, and as I said before, I wasn't around um, during the weekends, so I, don't, I can't talk about that first year. I can only talk about the, retreat, the monthly retreats <coughs> and the holiday retreats, because those are the ones that I was part of. Um, so let's focus on those. Okay. Um, how would you describe what the the what place did prayer have? How what was the role of prayer within the, the priorities of the Chavurah? 
Uh, it was definitely a high priority. I mean, it was just it was organized before we went on a retreat or um, or for any event. We definitely had our own services for maybe 20 years uh, for the high holidays for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, it was very hard to transition to a regular synagogue after going um, being with the Chavara for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, and it was very hard to transition to a regular synagogue, period, after the experience of the Chavara, right. or well, during the experience of the Chavara. So, um, uh, but let's mainly pe- focus on these early years. Yeah, so, so people took um, the assignments, um, I'll do Shacharit, uh, somebody else would read the Torah, somebody else would do the Haftorah, somebody else would do Musaf. Um, uh, so the assignments were done, somebody else gave a Dvar Torah. Uh, the services got got done. We the first couple of years, the davening was all done sitting on the floor, in a circle. Um, afterwards, cushions or just on the floor? Straight on the floor. <laughs> afterward, you know, people, you know, we got a little older, we moved to chairs. But but most of the mostly uh, the first couple of years, um, we had some chairs, we had some sofas, but most of it was on the on the floor. Did you have a safer Torah? First of course, years. we always had a Sefer Torah, and with that Sefer, Sefer Torah always came on retreats. Um, so someone would drive it up? Yes, with the food, <laughs> before, before Shabbat and after Shabbat. Yes, there was always, yes, the Sefer Torah was always there. And the Sidurim were always there. Um, before Sukkot, um, somebody was responsible for buying all the stuff to build the sukkah. Two or three or four people a volunteer to go up the morning of the retreat to build the sukkah. It was a big deal building the sukkah. And once my second husband became involved, uh, the architect, um, uh, he was always um, recruited to, um, to to head the building of the sukkah committee. So, um. Um, <clears throat> what would you, how would you characterize the attitude towards um, and the practice regarding women's roles in, in public worship in the beginning? <clears throat> You know, um, feminism was, was, was sort of very new at that point, um, and I said to you that most of the, the members, except for one, were all men, so the, all the davening was done basically by men. But, but quite quickly afterwards, um, you know, we had Paula Hyman, um, uh, women started taking um, Martha, we had women started taking um, more of a role in tefillah um, and in, in Dvar Torah and in, in everything. So I would say that, um, and it was the inspiration of these particular women that got me to learn how, when I was 40 years old, my birthday present to myself was learning how to read Torah um, because it was about time that I did that. So how did you learn? I hired a bar mitzvah teacher. <laughs> I hired a student at the seminary who taught bar mitzvah and he taught me how to read Torah. So I read Torah, and I read Torah for the Chavra retreats, um, for the holiday retreats, not a regular, because I never got really good at it. And I still read Torah from time to time for, for big events. Somebody will say, it's, you know, the offer of my daughter, will you, will you take a piece? Or, you know, certainly for my, um, for my uh, granddaughter's bat mitzvah and, and every one of my grandson's bat mitzvahs, uh, I, read, I read Torah for those events and so did my daughter and she really had to memorize it because she never really learned she we both had to memorize it by this point i i don't know how to read torah any i don't read the truck by sight anymore right but you uh, but you did learn early i did i did i i knew how to do it and <clears throat> i learned a whole um cedra a whole um um parsha. Parsha, right many many people have pointed to the creative tension between um tradition and innovation as being a hallmark of services in the early Chavurot. Right. That feel, does that feel true for the New York Chavurot? Can you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was the, um, um, you know, I came from, um, I didn't come from a Hasidic background, I came from, you know, um, a Masnagdisha background. Uh, and, um, the, you know, um, the, the spiritualism that was brought into the, the service, you know, I, um, I was one of the eye rollers 
<laughs> the roller of eyes at the outset because you said you, know, you were somewhat cynical about sitting on the floor and humming yes I was somewhat cynical about sitting on the floor and humming and um, and you know I got into it I definitely definitely got into it and so I was I was trans I was transformed I came over to the light side <laughs> I came to the light side yes I, I, I decided I liked it so but what did you like about it what, what brought you over brought you over um, the relaxation of it, um, the, 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 the oneness of, of the kahal, the oneness of the group, um, the feeling that there might be some listening entity, <laughs> um, everything that it's supposed to, I guess if you really look at what, what that kind of thing is supposed to how it's supposed to move you and bring you to a different place it eventually brought me to that place. So I was, uh, yes, I, I bought it. I drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, Rev Zalman, Shlomo Karl Bach, excuse me, Karl Bach and, and others were important influences in, in um, the experience of davening and also music in, in uh, Jewish prayer at Chavrat Shalom, at Fabrengen. Was that true, would you say, at the New York cover -up? No. Um, I knew Zalman um, early on before any of the cover -up Where I, I met him when I went, first went to Ramah. It was um, Ramah, Connecticut, so it was, 19, it was basically very early. And he came into Arts and Crafts when I was the only one there, and he said, um, you know, I look at this chassid, you know, of course, he walks into this conservative camp. What did he look like? He looked like a sloppy chassid. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, he wasn't wearing his, his bekesha, he wasn't wearing the coat, he was, but he had the full beard and the, and the talus hanging out, you know, the tzitzis hanging, you know, the tzitzis completely revealed and, and long pants and black shoes and, you know, he looked like a chassid. He looked terribly out of place and he walks into my arts and crafts, I was the only one there, and he said, um, and I said, can I help you? And he said, um, um, I'm looking to find a space from the Talisarium. I said, the what? <laughs> he said, the Talisarium. And I said, what's a Talisarium? And he said, oh, everybody in this camp is going to make a Talis. And I said, okay. And he found a space, an outdoor space, under the arts and crafts shack, which he decorated as a talisarium. What and do you every mean under? well, it was an elevated, um, was elevated on poles. The arts and crafts shack was elevated, and he, he found this thing with a six foot ceiling on the underside of the with open open completely sides. open. <laughs> that that was his space and he loved it and it was talisarium and everybody made a talus that summer. It was um it was uh, and he was very charismatic. He was very charismatic. Girls too? I believe so. I think girls did or maybe the next year girls did. I was friendly, his daughter was in camp that year and um and I bunked with her and we we became friends for that summer. His daughter Miriam. I never saw her again. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, did Zalman have, did he ever come to the New York Havara? I don't remember Zalman as coming to the New York Havara. He might have when I wasn't there. So, um, uh, uh, no, I, I don't remember him being there. Do you um, recall any other kinds of um, experimentation or innovations that from other um, religious traditions or secular traditions that people brought in, like poetry. Yeah, music, uh, we, we were we were we were tried very hard to bring other things in. We brought in poetry. We brought in music. We brought in um, uh, not me because I, I I wasn't into those things. Um, brought in um, um, especially when Richie came. Richie, Richie Siegel, Siegel came, right? He's a lot of you know humming on the floor. Sitting on the floor and humming. Do you recall uh, a service that he did like that? All of them. Yes, of course. <laughs> right. Can you describe one? What would happen? And we all sat on. We all got into the nigun. We all resonated with the nigun. Uh, it was it was very nice. I mean, it was really very nice. I started very cynical, but 
couple of us started cynical. I wasn't the only cynical person there. Uh, but, you know, we all got into it. it eventually got into it. So, um, uh, but they were, you know, it was musical instruments that were not part of my tradition, um, at either in conservative synagogues at that time or um, um, alternate, especially for the high holidays, alternate prayers for you know, sending the goat out, the sacrifice of the goat, um, alternate prayers for, um, you know, now all the synagogues do that. All the conservative synagogues do, do these, these alternate um, memorial things. Um, but, um, but none of my synagogues were doing it at the time, and so that was pretty innovative. So they were new, these were new. Yeah, it was new to me and, and new to all of us. So we were just, you know, trying to make our way through making, making the davening and making the prayer more relevant to us as who we were, um, bringing in some political statements, um, uh, you know, how do we deal with the prayer for Israel, how do we deal with the prayer for the United States when the war in Vietnam is going on. Um, uh, these were all issues that, that we talked about and dealt with. Um, and how would you deal, for instance, with prayer for the United States when we rewrote it? <laughs> I'm sure we rewrote it. Um, you know, it's it's um, even even the prayer for Israel right now is you know support, totally supporting the government and supporting the um, the tzava and supporting whatever. Now um, in my synagogue, it doesn't read like it reads in my brother's Orthodox synagogue. My brother's Orthodox synagogue is a lot more of a um, um, it's less gray, it's more black and white in terms of the support for Israel and the tzava and the soldiers, etc. And in, in my synagogue, the prayer is a little bit more modified, and definitely in support of Israel, but um, much more um, modified as, in, you, know, you know, hoping that Israel will be a light for peace in the world, etc. It, it, you know, and I think that we, we did that, we did that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if others were doing it at the time, but we were doing it. In the fall of 1971, uh, Martha Ecclesburg and, um, and Dina Rosenfeld had the idea of starting a class on the status of women um, <clears throat> that grew out of their experience of davening mm -hmm. at the Chavura. Did you know about the class? Um, no, I was I was probably out of it by then. Um, I I knew when Ezrat Nashim was formed. Um, um, all my friends were in Ezrat Nashim. They talked about it all the time. I was not in Ezrat Nashim until I came back into the community, and then uh, I was, several years later, which was several years later. When so. did you come back? Was it seventy four? Um, let me see, seventy four, maybe seventy four, seventy five. Right. So you had left because of a, a job. My husband's, husband's job, right. Job mm -hmm. At Stony Brook. Yes. And when was that? Um, Sharon was four months old. She was born in September 70. We left February 71 and came back um, when she was exactly four. So it was four years later. So it was seven February, so what I said, February? 71, you said. Yeah. So it was three and a half years later, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, 71, 72, 73, 74, 74, 75. We're Same. back in, 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 with an apartment in the Upper West Side. Right. So. so a lot had happened in terms of the a lot had happened. beginning of yes. Jewish feminism. And we were very aware of what was going on, um, where we were, but I wasn't, I wasn't a player in that early movement. I didn't go with Ezra and Hashim up to uh, we was a Grossinger's Hotel or the Concord to bust up the, um, sorry, I didn't go. <laughs> what about the conference, the first conference on um, Jewish women that took place, the National Conference in 1973, I believe? Uh, in New York. I was there. I was yeah. definitely part of all the National Conferences. I, I definitely was there. So that, that was... So I came in for that, yes. You came in for that. What right. was that like for you? Can you remember? There were four or five hundred people. Women, it was great. That first it was it was wonderful. But already, I, w I was already a feminist. Remember, <clears throat> I was a feminist because I fought my way through architecture school. So I, it wasn't like uh, so. I was a feminist, a, a secular feminist, before I was a Jewish feminist. Um, when I was in Stony Brook, all those years, I was part of a conscience raising group. Um, so I, I was I had I had credentials. <laughs> 
in, in the feminist movement. Uh, and you were a working mother. And I was a working and mother. Wife. And I was in a non-traditional, um, and I was working on a construction site. I worked on a construction site. It was, I was the only woman. There were 350 men on the construction site. So mm -hmm. I was definitely a feminist. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not unusual for me to be a Jewish feminist. I just thought it was really great to be among all these Jews, and some of them orthodox. And, um, and trying to make their way through the tradition and figuring out how to, um, I, you know, it was more, I think it was more enlightening for the people who were still within the Orthodox tradition, which I wasn't anymore. You know, I had long since left that yeah. woman's role in an Orthodox, and that's long since left it. Was there a time that you remember where uh, women started wearing um, Lacing. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. When was that? Um, and, and also being counted in a minion, for instance. <clears throat> I, you know, I, I'm trying to think. I think women were counted in the minion in the Chavara, but I don't, you know, that's an interesting question. Somebody has to, somebody else has to answer that question. When were women counted in the Chavara as a minion? I, I would say from early on, but I can't swear to it. I would mm -hmm. say um, that. Um, a lot of women wore talis, some, some women, I don't, um, cover, uh, mo a lot of women covered their heads, um, and, um, uh, and um, I remember we went to a bar mitzvah, a chavra bar mitzvah in, in Teaneck, New Jersey, and it was, um, it was, uh, um, and I came in with my, my child, and another friend of mine came in with her infant, this was later on, and um, and Paula, you know, came in, etc., with our children, and so um, we we were all in the um, in this conservative conservative synagogue. So um, and so somebody said to me, um, and I'm sitting with this child on my lap, and he he says, "You have to cover your hair," and I said, "I'm not married." Oh, well, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. I never covered my hair in shul. You weren't at that point because you were divorced, you mean? I was divorced, but, but I answered honestly. I I'm said I'm not married. And so then there's a, my friend is sitting there with her adopted infant, you know, in her lap. And he said, well, you have to cover your hair. And she said, I'm not married either. <laughs> and then she... Then he walked over to Paula, who was wearing a talus and a kippah and everything. He said, you're going to have to take that off. And she said, what? <laughs> Go away. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I mean, we, we made such waves in that synagogue <laughs> um, because, um, because you know, we weren't going you know, we to change. <laughs> Do you remember when you first wore a talus? Um, I first, I think I've... I first wore a talus when I first had my first aliyah. Um, so I borrowed my husband's talus and I said, I'm going to the Torah, I need a talus. When was that? Um, I don't know, probably I was in my 30s, probably in my 30s, maybe in my 20s. I have to really tell you that um, going to the Torah either for an aliyah or to read, especially to read Torah, is profound in my life. I don't do it too often, but it is profound. It is a um, very, very important and totally move, moving moment for me every time I do it. More than almost anything else I do Jewishly, standing at the Torah with the Yad and reading Torah from that print moves me beyond almost anything religiously that I've ever done. It is very important to me, and I, and I should do it more often, but I don't. Because I, I, I have to be perfect. I need to, need to be perfect, and it takes me weeks to do, to become perfect. Yeah. Perfect in the reading and perfect in the um, trouble. I need to be perfect. If I didn't need to be perfect, I would do it more often. But it is one of my more profound moments, yeah. Jewishly. Um, <clears throat> do you remember... Um, from that period in the 70s, as, and as you were saying, the the um, sort of the the height, the the strongest period in the New York Havara was not the first year, but starting in the second, third, fourth, yeah. and in that period in the mid and into the mid and later, at least mid 70s. 
Past that. Past that. Pretty much going to the 80s, I would say. The Chavara mm -hmm. was pretty strong, very, very strong for a very long time. Do you remember um, any significant, in your, in your memory anyway, first, first time women did various kinds of things? Um, Shalich Tzibor, reading Torah, other people's first aliyahs, bat mitzvahs, and any of those kinds of things. Not specifically. Not specifically. Mm -hmm. do, um, do you have a sense of how, how that changed over time? Even, even if there was a, a relatively egalitarian attitude from the beginning, still it changed because not many women knew how to do those things right. early on. Well, certainly not the first year. I, don't, I can't think of anybody that knew how to do it that first year. Any of the, because we were basically, except for one, we were all girlfriends or wives. So um, I don't think there was anybody, maybe Martha, I don't know. Um, I'm not even sure about her. But um, once, once we did it, those women who were strong in those areas um, basically participated. It might have been the Dvar Torah, it might have been you know, reading the Torah, it might have been davening, and it was a gradual transition, so it wasn't like an abrupt one. It wasn't something that and one day we decided this is what's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it, was, um, it was more of um, women learning how to do it and then taking over. It's like one day I declared, and this was, I was a Johnny come lately, one day I declared, I know the, I know the, um, I know the, uh, what was it, it was um, Sukkot reading. I know the Parsha for Sukkot. I want to do it. And they said, whoa, great, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and that was it, yeah. Yeah. Was there an evolution of attitudes towards um, egalitarianism and what constituted, let's say, genuine egalitarianism within the Chavara over the course of those years? It was, um, it was an evolution, it wasn't a revolution. Um, it, it, it happened, I would say that, um, I'm trying to, I think that most of the, most of the men in the Chavara were, um, if they weren't feminists to begin with, they became feminists. They were married to uh, high-pressured women. Um, they were married to pe women in careers. Um, I think that, um, and, and probably my generation was the first generation with, and this group was um, the first generation to have high-pressured careers and be in the, in the world, um, either as academics like um, Paula, like um, Judith, like Martha, um, um, like now Dina, um, uh, Flora, <laughs> Jackie, <laughs> we're all <laughs> We're all college-level academics, myself, because I became an academic um, uh, after a few years working as an architect. So uh, we all um, basically, so the, the, I don't think any of the men had any problem with it. Yeah. They were happy to have another set of Torah readers. <laughs> and the kids who were growing up in the Chavara, were they growing up basically feeling, experiencing Egal basic sort of egalitarianism where their mothers were as likely to be leading, leading services, reading those, those who led. I mean, you remember there's some men that didn't lead either. Not everybody, um, not everybody led services. Not everybody was equipped to lead services. So there were women that were uh, 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 probably a minority in the beginning and the majority of the, of the work went to the men. But um, but I think they, they grew up in in Egalit in I think they they you have to ask the kids <laughs> you'll have to ask the kids <laughs> some things you have to ask the kids yeah so let's just uh, turn to the issue of social justice and social activism for a minute because uh, the New York Havarot as the other Havarot were founded and grounded in what Meredith Wucher called the nexus of uh, political and religious values that a lot of people right. were looking for that yeah actually yeah um, how important was political activism to you personally as a component of very important, very important it was a very important component
moment of what I did. Um, it was um, it, uh, the demonstrations that I went to were with the Chavara. The Washington trips I made were always with the Chavara. I wasn't independent. I didn't get on a, until later did I get on a bus and, and go to a demonstration in Washington, but it was always with the Chavara. Um, we marched together. Um, sometimes our shift for particular events were four o'clock in the morning. We set the alarm. We got up at four o'clock in the morning and we marched until eight o'clock in the morning. Um, it was it was a very it was it was one of the very important highlights of of the Chavara. Now I have to also say that once I was knew I was pregnant. Um, uh, and I didn't, I, I, once I was visibly pregnant, I was afraid of being jostled, so um, I didn't go anymore. But, so for, but for the first year, we must have gone down to Washington quite a few times. Did you go, did you and David go on the, the, the march on Washington in 69? Yes. Yeah. Which yeah. was the, the mobilization. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we went on March on Washington. We went, went, went a few times, I would say three times, maybe four, mm -hmm. in that first year and a half. Um, well, let me see. Yeah, I got the first year before I was um, terribly pregnant or had a newborn infant. And where would you stay when you were in Washington? <laughs> there was um, uh, one time we stayed in Jerry Serrata's sister's studio apartment. Jerry Serrata's sister uh, had a studio apartment. We must have been 20 people that descended on her in that apartment. So she had um, one bathroom and, um, and we were 21 people, if you count her. And I think it was Jerry's sister. I think it was Jerry's sister. And we had to call dibs on, um, we took turns sleeping because even floor space, you know, who was on the piano, who was under the piano, <laughs> who got the sofa. Um, now, it was decided early on that the women would be able to use the bathroom, but the men had to run downstairs across the street to the gas station <laughs> and use the toilet in the gas station, <laughs> even in the middle of the night. <laughs> you look out the window and you can see one of us running across the street to the gas station because there was just too many people in that poor bathroom. So and did, did you daven together on those occasions, or we, uh, yeah. what? What was it? A Jewish event in that sense? Um, it was not a weekend necessarily. Um, so if it wasn't a weekend, we we might have said shacharit. I mean, I don't remember. Um, we also, you know, we also, everybody was, that particular march, I think, was the one we did in the middle of the night. And, you know, so, so, it was, I don't remember that, I don't remember davening. I mean, I don't think we were there for weekends, um, for that particular, those particular times. Mm -hmm. Um, remember we always had, you know, I was still Shoma Shabbos at that point. So, and so were a few of us. I wasn't so orthodox, had, but I was so, Shoma Shabbos. So it had to be walking distance. You, you walked. So we had a, if it was on yeah, Shabbos. If it's on Shabbos, we had to walk to wherever we were going, right? right. Um, the Six Day War had happened in June of 67. Yeah, I was going to say that's before the Chavara. Somewhat, sure. I mean, not that long yeah. before, two, two, two years before. Did the war and Israel generally have any significant impact on your Jewish identity at that point? Not my Jewish identity. I mean, I've always had a very strong Jewish identity. I don't think that's ever been challenged. Um, I don't think I've ever challenged my Jewish identity. Um, it was it was a profound, totally terrifying, scary moment the, leading up to the Six Day War. Mm -hmm. um, happy to know that it turned out, which we thought was great. Now we're challenging and rethinking how great all that territory was. But at that time, we thought it was terrific. Right. Um, In addition to Ezra Nashim, another significant organization that came out now. of uh, the New York Havara was Breira, yeah. in, which was formed in 73. Right. And had its offices, office uh -huh. in the apartment um, early right. on. In its, it was very short-lived, about four, four mm -hmm. years or so. Um, um, 
Were you aware of Bray Ra? I was aware of Bray Ra. I was aware of the politics of Bray Ra. I was very sympathetic to the politics, but I wasn't in town at that time. So I wasn't, again, I was just like I wasn't part of Ezra and Hashim, I was aware of what was going on, but was not, we were not a part of it. Yeah. Um, many commentators have noted that political activism um, as a communal activity faded over time. And Bill Novak, for instance, for one, said that the inability to unite for joint political activity was what he considered to be the outstanding failure of the New York Havarat. He wrote that in 1970, so it was you know, relatively early on. Yeah, I would not agree with him on that in 1970, maybe by 74 or 75 or 76, yes. But, um, you know, it also depended on how, um, how active you were and how aware you were. I mean, Jerry Serrata was always very, very, very involved politically. I mean, you interviewed him, you must know that. Uh, very, very involved um, politically and very, very, very active. Um, on the left, um, so um, I, if he said that, I would, I would, I would say maybe that was his perception. Mm -hmm. But I'm surprised that Bill Novak said it, mm -hmm. because until '71, we always got out the vote. We were always marching in Washington. It seemed to me, right. and, and 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 I stopped doing it when I was visibly pregnant. And also, the Vietnam War came to an end. And so then that, you know, that happened too. So there was, you know, not a whole lot to protest. Um, whether we were sort of um, being the very politically active, um, pro-Palestinian, pro-peace, um, I don't remember. I don't remember coming as a group in that, moving in a, as a group in that direction. Maybe he was talking about that. I don't know. But as far as the war in Vietnam goes, I wouldn't even agree with that statement in 1970. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I want to move to sort of some larger reflections on what the Havara <laughs> meant, yeah. both um, in your own life um, and also its implications and impact on the larger Jewish community um, over the past half century. Um, so you were a member of the New York Harbor from its inception and onward until and onward and onward until, right. as one one member said uh, to us, it quote faded out. What would you say were the most significant ways that the New York Harbor um, evolved or changed over the course of the the seventies and into the eighties? Well, you know, what happened was that the, the most intense years, as I said, probably were the first five, six, or seven of it. Um, very, very intense, you know, the, the regular davening, the, um, the, um, the high holiday services, the regular retreats, etc. And then people got very, very intense. People, first of all, a lot of people moved away. A lot of people moved away. They still kept their ties, but they moved away. and. Um, and, um, and then they had ch children, and then they had a career moves, and they had uh, two people working in the family. So, you know, preparing for weekly davening, you know, people went to uh, Minyama At. Some of the people went to Minyama At. That's where Alan and, and, you know, Alan ended up, and that's where Howard and Dina ended up, etc. Because we were not doing the davening anymore. We weren't pulling it together on a weekly basis anymore. So I think that the weekly davening went first. Um, uh, the weekly meetings, uh, the, we had a, two apartments for a very, very long time. And then, you know, then the Upper West Side was coming up and the rents went high. So we didn't have an apartment anymore. So that was, that was also a pulling back. We were actually, um, the first year we were looking for a house to buy. I mean, to think that these draggly, graduate students with no money were looking for brownstones. I actually, being the architectural student, I was the one that was, went around to look at the brownstones. We looked at houses to buy. I said, where are you going to get the money from? They said, well, get a mortgage. I said, I don't have any money, you know, where are we going to get the down payment from? Don't worry about that, we'll get the down payment. <laughs> so we were, you know, we were really looking to live communally in that first year. Um, and then, you know, little by little it faded away. 
Um, but we still, um, I mean, we still get together as a Chavura at least once a year um, on, on Rosh Hashanah. Um, when, when on Rosh Hashanah do you get uh, together? After everybody goes to shul on the afternoon of Tashlich, we get together as a community of past members, current members. We sometimes get 40 people for lunch. And where do you meet? Uh, here, once on my roof. Um, Apart people's homes. Pe people's homes, that's all we have. And people bring food um, to this, and we have a communal dinner, and then we go to Tashlich together. So the Chavara still lives in that. Um, Sunday night I'm going to dinner at a friend's house, and it's all Chavara people. Um, my, my strongest, longest standing friends um, are still my Chavara friends. Um, I, I don't have any ele elementary school friends anymore. I don't have um, any um, friends from um, high school anymore. Um, but my f couple of my strong friends from Pratt I still have, and mm, the basis of my friendships, long-term friendships, are from the New York Havara. And what's striking is that that's true for so many, which is yeah. why you get 40 people. Which is and why we get 40 people, right. So and. And, um, and when somebody comes from Boston, or somebody comes in from Montreal, or somebody flies in from the coast, Issa Aaron comes in from the coast, or the hundreds come in from whatever, we get the call, you know, who's coming to dinner, how many are we, and we make a reservation. You know, and there might be 12, and there might be 15 people that will get together to say hi to that person who's coming, who we haven't seen in a while. So this is, so the, the, I can't really say that Chavara died completely. But it sort of faded away in terms of that, that activism. And, and it's interesting that in my new life and creating community here on the Upper West Side, my example really is the Chavara. And Talk about that. So you, you've retired in the last couple of years? Yeah, I retired maybe six years ago. From your career as an architect, as an academic? As a, a yeah. Um, and. Um, at some point, and, and my, my husband Herman was the, the impetus behind the Bloomingdale Aging in Place, that um, he said that there was a community in uh, Boston, Beacon Hill, there was a, um, uh, an Aging in Place organization called Beacon Hill, and it was in the Times. There was a whole article about it in the Times, and he said, you know, we should be doing that on the Upper West Side. Not him, God forbid. <laughs> Somebody should be doing that on the Upper West Side. So um, he gave me the article, and then um, we met. We have a, we had a very active. We have a very active block association here on the street, and so we took that idea to the president of the block association um, in the elevator, and she said, "Oh, that's a good idea. Why don't you come to a board meeting and talk about it?" So we went to a board meeting and we talked about that, um, and then sh she took it to the neighboring block association president and. They got very excited about the idea, and we were invited to become part of a steering committee of 12 people, and we put together Bloomingdale Aging in Place. Where did uh, the name come from? This, is, this area is a Bloomingdale Road. Broadway was called the Bloomingdale Road in this section. It's the Boston Post Road. It's the road that went to Boston. And um, the, 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 our neighborhood branch library is the Bloomingdale Library. Um, so it's not, it's historically noted. And um, we had a smaller border, and now we have a slightly bigger border, but it's a geographic area. We have no age limit. Um, we only have a geographic uh, area. And it was to help people who were um, aging. But we, we decided early on we weren't going to charge any, anybody anything. We weren't going to pay anybody anything. So it's all volunteer. And we have, by this time, we must have 1,300 members. Act, and, and half of them are very active. So how do you see it as? How did I see it as? Well, first of all, when you're part of a Chavara, then you learn how to do lots of things. You learn how to organize things. You learn how to keep lists. You learn how to, you just learn a lot that you've, you've and of course I was a dean. So I learned a lot from the Chavara that I took when I became a dean. And, you know, in, in terms of organizational skills and people skills. And, um, and you take that and, and um, you know, we have, um, we have, um, uh, 
you know, uh, bring, bring stuff, dinners, and people can't organize it. And I said, what is so difficult about a potluck dinner? You know, you sign somebody, you know, two people to bring the um, uh, protein dish for, you know, 13, and you assign two people to bring vegetables, and you talk, two people the starch dish, and two people the dessert, the bread, and somebody else the wine, and somebody else, yeah, what is so difficult? I mean, they, they, they look at me as I'm doing magic. Well, this is all we did for, you know, for Chavara. We did this over and over and over again. To me, it's just second nature. It's just some of these things that, you know, are so easy for me are so difficult for others. And so this aspect of community building um, yeah. is what feels in so many ways to you as living, so to speak, in the legacy of, exactly. of the Chavara. Ex exactly. It's exactly what I feel is the legacy for me of the Chavara, is this is what I had and this is what I want others to feel. And it's amazing what, how many people feel it. And it's amazing how we've grown. And we've, we do it by not by, um, by, by massive amounts of people. We do it by, by units of people. So that woman, Small groups. That woman we met in the diner was um, a woman who was in my history reading group. Um, I, um, I'm leading a, um, a walking group twice a week. These people go out for coffee afterwards, they bond, they form community. So when you're walking down the street, you know, you start knowing people. <laughs> my, my brother said to me, God Almighty, you know every old lady in the neighborhood? <laughs> and I said, yeah, maybe. And, and a lot of the old men too. <laughs> um, so that's um, very much in the legacy of what was most uh, sort of strong and positive about the Chavara. When you look back on the Chavara, what do you see as having been most challenging about it? Keeping, not, not, not yeah. Not necessarily for you personally, but the, what were the kinds of yeah. challenges? The challenge, the biggest challenge, and obviously, um, and I don't know what happened to Chavara Shalom, I think it's it's still there. It's morphed into something else. Different people. It's it's so. it's yeah. it's very different. I'm assuming. Very different. Very very different As than what it's been. Right. Um, uh, I think that the challenge, the biggest challenge, is keeping that amazing amount of dedication and the work people put into it, and the, the work they were able to do when they were graduate students and single or newly married and didn't have kids and didn't have to write, you know, didn't have to get tenure and didn't have to. Um, work two jobs, um, keeping that that going. That was the challenge, and and basically, um, and we always did bring in new members, but but it's um, but it didn't it, it it it's still there, but it's not there the way it was. And it's different people. It's not no, it's the same people. For the, your. Your group is yeah. the same people, but the people who, for instance, oh no, no, they are, yeah, they managed to keep the dynamic, but it's not the same dynamic anymore. It's yeah. different, and I imagine how many old, how many of the oldest members are still, are still there. None this of them. This is them. No. None of them. All right. So is that good or bad? Mm -hmm. One of the things about Bloomingdale Aging in Place that we decided very early on was that there would be term limits to the leadership. So um, I was on the board for the first six or seven years, but I'm no longer on the board. I still have a leadership position because I'm, I'm head of activities, and activities is 85% of what we do. And, and all the other, a lot of the other former board members have very important roles, but they're not making policy anymore. We have all new people making policy. Right. And maybe that's good, maybe that's not, and, and we're, whether it's going in the direction that the original steering committee framed for it. My feeling is that it has to, that, that every organization has to morph and every organization has to uh, grow organically and, and become, decide where it's going every year and, 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 and like a tree move with the wind. Um, and if it doesn't do that, then it dies. So I guess Havarat Shalom did do that and they still, they still have an organization. We, we have a friendship. We have cousins. We've remained cousins. I think that's what people in the original Chavarat Shalom right. have also, yeah. which is, it leads me to an, another uh, thought, which is that 
One of the things that people in the early Chavarot, and certainly in Chavarot Shalom, where there was tremendous emphasis on this, struggled with was the demands on intimacy, on being intimate with other intimate mm -hmm. and deeply open with other people, right. with everybody else in the group, and a lot of processing around that kind of intimacy, which, which people struggled with. Um, uh, I, I don't remember that becoming um, an issue of intimacy with the group. I think that friendships developed, strong friendships, mostly because we were thrown together so much. Mm -hmm. uh, we were with each other more than we were with, with our extended families. We were with each other more often than we were with people we went to school with, with any of our other friends. Mm -hmm. So when you saw people twice a week or three days a week, that's a lot. Indeed. That's Indeed. a lot. So, you know, you, I guess you, you know, I know all the tragedies and the high points of all these people's lives. I care and, about these people. And yet there were events that took place. Some, there were some divorces. There were... Um, right. Uh, people who uh, struggled with homo, homosexuality or homoerotic feelings that surfaced for them within the group, etc. That, that sort of complicated relationships within the group. Is that fair? That's fair. That's fair. Uh, whether it broke us, it didn't break us. Right. And that was, that's the important part. Whether we had, were challenged by it, um, yes, we were challenged by it. Um, whether the, the people that you're talking about thrust it in our faces and said, you know, you know, take it or leave it, they didn't. They stepped back. They stepped back and only stepped back in when they felt that the waters were warm. Um, uh, that's my reading of, of what they did. Um, so it didn't, it didn't in, a, in a lot of ways, it didn't hurt us. Um, but it was, it was, it was life. I mean, it was, we, we, just like any family, any, any group of people, any, any neighbor, any block, um, that comes close together, we had the same challenges everybody in our generations were, were feeling marriages that broke up, even, even within, you know, and, and you don't even probably know all of them. <laughs> you probably only know the ones that your people you're interviewing, but there were others other marriages that broke up because of intimacy within, within the group. Within, yeah, within the group, right. Did you ever become involved with other Chavarot um, over the course of, what happened with your personal sort of journey? My personal journey? Um, no, I never, because I was always in New York, so I never became part of, I was always part of the New York Chavarot. Um, we had um, um, joint um, retreat, we had one joint retreat with the Chavrat Shalom, I think in the second year. I remember because I went, up, I went to Boston with, with the baby. Did you ever go to Weiss's Farm, any of the retreats at Weiss's Farm, the inter -Havara Oh, the inter -Havara. No, I never became part of the inter the Weiss's Farm. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it started when I was out and I just, I just never became part of it. And what about the, the uh, National Havara? I never became you know, aware of it, but I never participated. Didn't in appeal it. to you? It appealed. Um, it appealed, but um, either I was in the middle of a divorce at the time or I had a new relationship. But I just never went. Yeah. I never went. Nobody actually said, you know, Phyllis, you got to come. I'm making you a reservation. I mean, sometimes you need somebody to drag you into it. <laughs> true, true. W would you say that there are enduring aspects of the Chavara vision that continue to motivate you in, in your life, um, in your Jewish life, and, in, and generally speaking, too? I mean, did you join a synagogue, for instance? Did you, are there, are there, I mean, clearly the issue of community has continued to be very important to me, important. right. Um, yeah, Jew Jewishly, I was, I sadly joined, I sadly needed to join a synagogue because I needed to, to, um, to um, belong to a community once the Chavara wasn't davening. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I joined a, a synagogue, uh, I still belong to a synagogue. Um, <coughs> I, I, I'm not a, um, a weekly worshiper. Yeah. I'm not, that's not who I am, so anymore. Are there any ways in which you feel like your, um, 
your Jewish life, your ideas about Judaism and about Jewish life have diverged significantly from what you what was important to you during your Chabura period? No, I don't think so. I think that those were very formative years in terms of egalitarianism, <coughs> in terms of, um, of belief, and in terms of um, my morphing from, from an orthodox woman to a non-orthodox woman, let's put it this way. Um, um, in terms of my, um, um, my commitment to Judaism, in terms of my identity as a Jew, um, I think that being part of the Chavara um, kept me very much in the fold when I might have drifted off from it uh, at that point. Um, uh, still does, probably. Do, do you still consider yourself a, quote, Chavara Jew? Yes. I never really thought of it that way, but how quickly the, the yes came out would tell you. Yes. I haven't thought about it. So as we were saying, as in the course of your career, you've worked as an academic, you've worked as a practicing architect, you've worked um, as a dean, um, and you, you had a private practice. Are there any ways in which your Chavara experience had an impact on your vision for yourself professionally or in your work? It's hard to say. I mean, it's hard to come up with a glib answer. Um, the intense relationships and the friendships that were made in the Chavara, the assertion, self-assertion, when I had to make that speech to the Chavara that first year on, on the fact that, what do you mean we're not part of the Chavara? Um, I think that that was part and parcel of, of um, building me up as a professional, uh, being able to assert myself. I can't say the Chavara, this is all that the Chavara, it was all due to the Chavara, but I think that it's, um, it, part of it was due to the Chavara. I had the first baby in the Chavara, so um, that first year, and I had no intention of breastfeeding. No intention of breastfeeding. But they, those women, they clamored on me. I mean, these these 22-year-olds, they were like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? You gotta breastfeed, you have to go long to la leche, you have to do, get the, you know, we didn't even have pumps in those days. It was pre-pump days. You have to, you know, you have to, well, you have to breastfeed. So um, when I went to the hospital and, they, and I said, I'm breastfeeding, and they, they said, what? <laughs> No, you know, I can't breastfeed here. I said, I'm breastfeeding. And people said, how come you're breastfeeding? I said, my friends won't talk to me if I don't breastfeed. I'm pressured. <laughs> because, you know, was, everybody was saying at that time that women were pressured to not breastfeed, that they had to be strong to, you know, to, to, be, to breastfeed. They had to really assert themselves. Me, it was the opposite. I had to breastfeed because nobody will talk to me if I bottle fed this kid. <laughs> so I became I, bre I breastfed. <laughs> That's how you know. These are the these are the pressures of of who you're with. These are the peer pressures, and they were good peer pressures. <laughs> Indeed. So finally, um, looking back, it's a, almost a half a century. Next year, 2018, will be a half a century since the founding mm. of the first Chabura. Chavarat Shalom in 1968. So what would you say have been the Chavarat's most important contributions as we sort of are moving really Societally, societally. Yeah. I think that the Chavarat movement in general, those first three Chavarat um, were looked at, at by synagogues as the way to go. And I think that the impact um, on synagogues was to start their own, whatever they called, little Chavarot within the synagogue movement. I know that that was done. Um, and also the introduction of um, alternate means of, of prayer, of, of, of guitars and poetry and, and, and readings during services, etc. I don't know if it was done much before. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, the introduction of taking the nigun to the next level and after, you know, the la-la-la-la-las, the eternal la-la-la-la-las, that's definitely <laughs> Mechavara. 
um, the alternative um, um, renew, Jewish renewal movement is a Chavara uh, outcome. Um, would they have done it without the Chavara? Who, who knows? So I think that on, on Jewish life, certainly, um, the Chavara um, collectively, uh, Chavara movement definitely impacted um, Ju Judaism. I think it had a, a, a big impact on it. Um, uh, whether that legacy will survive, I think it will. I think that that innovativeness and that uh, forming community definitely. And you know, here I am in a large synagogue, <laughs> happy to be sitting in the back pew and just letting it wash over me. I'm very happy to do that now. But still. Still, and still very involved in creating community. And still, in another way, very involved in creating community. Phyllis, thank you so much. It's been oh. really, really wonderful okay. to talk to you. Right. And uh, we're very grateful. Thanks. Okay.